I'm going to hand it over to Marion to talk about identity and access management. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, let me share my slides. Hope you can all see that. Um, okay, so again, a warm welcome to my talk about uh, challenges and pitfalls of identity and access management in the cloud, where I mainly focus on AWS IM as cloud work provider, but I would say many of uh, these obstacles are common regardless of the cloud provider you are choosing, as IM is a complex thing. Um, my talk is a, has a slightly striking title, the IAM role chaos, and um, of course I do not think or I do not believe that IAM it in itself is chaotic, but uh, it may become a mess uh, if you are underestimating the complexity and just start right away without having even an idea about IAM and a kind of master plan in place. And I can tell you that is not the seldom case. Um, beside all that, I had a lot of conversations about IAM, especially related to automation of deployment of infrastructure. And it is indeed an increasingly important uh, topic when working with infrastructure and infrastructure as code. So I'd like to start uh, off with a brief introduction of identity and access management, what it is and why it is so increasingly important in the cloud. And after that, I dive deeper into the challenges and pitfall and how you may avoid getting lost in the jungle of policies, roles, and uh, permissions. I will talk about the challenges which uh, occur on enterprise side or on the infrastructure team side, uh, as well as on uh, the side from, uh, from the perspective of a cross-functional team. Uh, if you have to deal with multiple accounts and later on uh, over the, um, um, if you, yeah, and you, you have to view both perspectives because you will have to later on work with a lot of accounts and it's important to set that up properly. Um, uh, getting identity and access management right is a journey and it takes some effort and time, but it is advisable at worst to spend that time. I, I can really recommend that. Um, at the end, I hope that this talk gives you some heads up and gives some awareness of the importance of identity and access management in the cloud. So now, what is identity and access management? First of all, it's not an invention of the cloud era. It was always there. And to put it into more maybe simple words than uh, the Wikipedia does, um, identity and access management is the discipline that enables right individuals uh, or identities to access the right resources uh, at the right time for the right reason. That sounds, first of all, simple, but um, there are actually two concepts behind, both of which um, uh, in itself can become really tricky. One is the authentication. That means individuals or systems have to authenticate in order to prove their identity when they access a system. And then after that was successful, um, the uh, authorization comes into the place. Um, and that is the process of checking when access to resources an entity has to uh, has or should have. So now, why is identity and access management in the cloud so important? The, the first thing is you cannot lock away the cloud. Well, you may can, but then uh, nobody can have access to your beautiful services and um, your, your applications. So uh, the security pyramid is no longer just around on-premise network as the traditional firewalls uh, roles based on VPN security model assume that you could establish a strong perimeter and then trust that activities within that perimeter were safe. But cloud environments are different. They are highly connected to the outer world. People can access the cloud from everywhere. Now, when you move to the cloud, the cloud providers, let, let it be Google or let it be AWS or Azure, and so on are reasonable, uh, responsible uh, for the security uh, of the underlying infrastructure and data center. So the security of um, uh, what builds up the cloud. However, there is a concept of shared responsibility. That means that you are responsible for your application layer. 
To put it in simple words, uh, cloud providers are responsible for the security of the cloud and you are responsible, responsible for whatever happens inside of the cloud. Therefore, you need to apply a defense, uh, a defense in depth approach with other security controls for all kinds of layers. That is the network, the VPC, the load balancers, the subnets. Um, and for every single instance you want to deploy in, into the cloud. In, into the cloud. Um, so let's look at this. Um, the tricky part already starts uh, with the identity, which was proved by an authentication. But how does the individual behind obtain that key for authentication? People can access from everywhere using their own that, um, device and you cannot necessarily trust anymore that the individual behind that identity is really what you think it, it should be. It could happen that an access key, however, that happened might have been taken by someone who should not have that key. And uh, you expose endpoints uh, and uh, e email services or storages um, and incoming events through these channels may trigger, for example, a serverless function that in turn connects to a resource inside your VPC and um, to do some, some processing on that. Or you even accidentally expose an, an endpoint to the public, which should of course never happen, but you never know. All this means your environment can become vulnerable. Um, so what are the consequences? Uh, so what happens if a little devil managed to get into your VPC? Your envi environment may be completely blow up. Uh, and here is where identity and access management comes into the game as one layer of security. Of course, there are other layers as mentioned before and uh, you should also take care on this one. As an example, in this scenario, the threat may came in through an email. Um, somebody sends an email and that email triggers an, a Lambda fun function and that in turn accesses another resource in your, in your VPC. In order to reduce the damage uh, which can happen by this, you can limit the access of this a particular function to only that particular resource. And maybe you go further and limit the action that the function can perform on this resource. And that is the authorization or access control uh, part of uh, IM. All cloud providers um, uh, give you a lot of our com comprehensive IM tools at hand, which enables you to do exactly what I have just described. So um, there are a few important security principles that can be enforced by your IM strategy. And um, um, the term least uh, privilege is certainly the, uh, the most known one. And it means that your user account and the continuing process only have that minimal rights and access to resources that they absolutely need. In contrast to overprivileged separation of pro, uh, in, in contrast to overprivileges, uh, um, separation of privileges uh, complements actually the least privilege and covers the broad separation of users and processes on different levels of trust and needs. Kind of overlapping with that um, uh, is uh, the separation of duties that covers separating tasks and functions between different roles to provide a layer of accountability and help prevent frauds. Just a second. Now, um, so how access control is in general working? There is this traditional access control or authorization model used in IAM, and that is called role-based access control. Our um, role-based access control defines permission based on its person's job function, uh, known as outside of the cloud computing as a role. As a uh, so a person has a specific job function or role, and that entitles that person to access or to, uh, to, to do specific things. Within the cloud, a role usually refers to an IM role that is similar to all cloud providers. 
which is an identity in IM that you can assume. You can attach policies or permissions that grant access to specific resources. Um, in, in the cloud, a role cannot be only assigned to a user or a group, but also to resources and systems. Attribute-based uh, access control is an authorization strategy that defines permissions based on attributes. In the world outside of the cloud, that could be attributes like region, country, etc. And these attributes can be matched um, then to resources that have the same attributes. In AWS, uh, you have a similar capab capability. Here, these attributes are called tags. And you can add these uh, attributes or tags to roles or users. Similarly, you can add the same attributes to resources for which you want to grant access. The advantage is that you can design a single policy or permission that you attach to, a, uh, to several roles to allow operations when the attribute of the role matches uh, the resource attribute. That means that you can reduce dramatically the amount of policies or permissions you have to define. Uh, in that uh, little example, here you have three roles which, with the same text, but of course different values. And you have resources having the same text and values accordingly. And you have one policy which you attach to each of that role um, as a condition that evaluates the text and values and do the matching. So after talking now a lot of about of theoretically things, so what is I am and how it is working, let's dive into the challenges and pitfalls. Um, First of all, uh, uh, I would like to look into what is needed from an enterprise point of view when you start or migrate into the cloud. Um, typically, and that is common to a lot of clients, um, you start with a, with a test account or a kind of sandbox. And then you start migrating applications and services to the cloud or you implement new services. There are infrastructure experts, uh, but also application teams, organized and cross-functional teams, which build the services and applications for your enterprise. You may have started to set up uh, more accounts, the infrastructure is growing, more services and applications will be rolled out, and also the number of cross-functional teams are growing. So what will you do? Adding an, or one account after another, add new users, or um, yes, maybe some account uh, a, a access control mechanism like roles and policies and permissions. So just adding additional accounts with more infrastructure and some permissions does not really scale, um, especially if you have to endure safe access to these accounts and to secure your data and services. You need somehow a concept of, or a kind of foundation how you want to organize your accounts and how you control across uh, access and permissions. So starting right away will, could be dangerous. It could be danger your entire environment. So getting the initial rights uh, is a crucial and impact also your identity and access management. And you do not want to invest all a lot of effort for refactoring or even worse to start all over again. In the following, I uh, won't explain how to set up an account, uh, many accounts, that is a different topic, but I explain what is important to consider when it comes to IM. Um, so first of all, um, the first thing you really have to do, prepare the foundation of your organization or prepare your baseline. And that, you are, that is what you typically do with your infrastructure and security teams, but also with other teams like the business team. So uh, the first important to, uh, thing is to do, um, define the structure of your organization. Um, uh, that also means involving business security, infrastructure, but also developer teams. This is to identify how, how you want to organize your account later on. Um, define your use cases when it comes to security data uh, and data protection. As an example, if you have really sensitive data, which, uh, 
requires rigorous compliance with uh, regards to GDPR, you want to limit access and deployment to specific regions in the cloud. Or you even need specific environments that are PCI compliant, so if you're running payment services. Define account segmentation strategy. That is the next thing you have to do. For example, you may want to categorize accounts into business units, uh, accounts, enterprise-wide accounts for infrastructure and security teams, and so forth. In, the, in addition, you need to define how the overall account structure for each team should look like including, of course, the infrastructure and security team. Um, for example, you want to establish a development test and production uh, uh, account for each team. Next step is the definition of default roles and permissions you want to assign to, for example, to the, the developer teams uh, of each business unit. Typically, you choose something like a developer role which, uh, with permission to create the infrastructure, uh, they need an administrator role that can be used to apply IM roles and permissions if you want to allow that, but I come to that uh, point uh, in a few minutes. And you may also consider uh, an auditor role with at least read access to all resources. Um, as you do not want to do everything manually, um, uh, you should already plan for automate, uh, automatizing everything. That means also implementing infrastructure as code, including all IM related resources, such as roles, permissions, and policies. Now you cannot have, of course, the full picture and plan for everything up front. Um, things are changing rapidly, so no stop here, but always revisit your requirements and use cases also before I forget and also, before I forget, threat modeling might be also a tool you should choose, especially when it comes to setting up all these access control things. Uh, part of identity and access management is authentication. Um, and it's a good practice to use federation in your organization and implement single sign-on. So no user should really be able to directly log into the cloud provider console or uh, do access from their terminals in, on their laptops, but use SSO and assume a role. You can integrate existing identity, uh, identity service providers such as Okta or OneLogin or Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Access Directory. Um, and not less important, enforce multi-factor authentication. Just remember um, the lost key from my little example at the beginning. Uh, multi-factor uh, uh, authentication could be also already a measure to prevent that. And never use your root account. Just no, lock it away. Don't ever even think about to use it to do some stuff uh, in your environment. And instead of assigning a single role to a single user, you should introduce groups, which are, for example, in alignment to your team structure and assign the required default roles to that group. These roles should be assumable by the user across accounts. So they have a developer account, they have a test account and production account. So you will apply these roles uh, to all of these accounts. In fact, a developer should never be able to do anything from their laptop, as mentioned. Um, so they should not use the command line tool of your cloud provider directly, but uh, always have assumed a specific role, which also requires uh, multi-factor authentication. And last but not least, enable CloudTrail in every region you want to run your service. Um, that is, of course, an AWS-specific tool, uh, but the other cloud vendors provide uh, similar um, uh, uh, functions, uh, functionality and tools. Again, last but not least, uh, use infrastructure code for your setup. Never do something manually. If something bro is bro breaking completely, it's, it will be never recoverable. Use a version control system for your infrastructure code and automatize everything where possible. After already talking a lot about roles and permissions to be assigned to users and develop, uh, of, uh, or the developer teams, you may ask who is allowed to do what? Should developer teams be able to whatever they need to do, also including across uh, access to IM, or should that be avoided? So question is centralizing or delegating. 
centralizing IM is a way to prevent everything, which is of course good, a good thing when it comes to security. But uh, by centralizing IM, developers will not be able to do to code policies and roles alongside with the applications and related infrastructure. That is bad because, for example, in AWS, uh, you have to assign for every single instance or serverless function a role and a policy. So that would be in consequence um, if you limit the access for the developers, that the developers um, have to get, come to always come to you uh, and have to ask you to, to write the role and the policy and to apply them. Or maybe they have uh, the right, but not, but not uh, the, the permission to apply these roles. And they always have to come to you that you review them. And then uh, you have to, to apply these roles and policies. So you will certainly become, as an infrastructure team, a uh, bottleneck. So either way would make the entire process really slow and also leads to building silos of competences. And even worse, uh, that you have also to consider um, that would also limit the capabilities of the developer teams to automata uh, for automation, which in turn has also a business impact. Today, you want to deliver new features and continuously and in short time frames in order to get fast feedback. So the answer should be centralizing or delegating. It should be delegate IM administration to developer teams in order to enable the teams to do what they need to do with IM for the applications and services. Let developer uh, move quickly and let them experiment with uh, IM, even though that may sound a little bit dangerous. Of course, uh, your main concern, concern will be still how to delegate IM to developer teams without losing the complete control. Um, in AWS IM, there, is, uh, there are some tools and measures that uh, at hand which helps you to delegate safely. And that can be achieved by using specific policies that you can attach to the roles of the developer. Um, so first one is service control policy. With service control policy, you can define the maximum permission of all identities in an account. So you do not grant permission, but limit them. You can limit permissions granted uh, in identity and resource-based policies. So with service control policies, you set actually the per permission guardrail. Uh, another policy is the permission boundary. Uh, here you ensure that the developer creates roles safely. With permission boundaries, you can define the maximum permission that an identity uh, user or role can grant to an IM ent uh, entity. But you cannot limit the permissions granted to the resources-based policy, say uh, resources-based policy. Same as for the uh, service control policies, um, you do not grant permissions, but you limit them. Last but not least, you have uh, identity-based policies at hand. So here you can control the creation of resources. For ex example, you can uh, limit um, the creation of resources um, to specific regions only, or you can use tags. So um, uh, the actually permission then that a uh, developer role has, uh, you can find in the intersection of all these three uh, policy types. Um, sorry. And how does that work in action? Um, here's a simple example of um, um, how services control permissions uh, are working in your organization structure. In this diagram, I also illustrate how you can structure accounts among organization units when you are using AWS organizations. AWS uh, provides this service called AWS organizations, which you can use to manage your accounts centrally. You can define organization units in alignment to your business units and infrastructure and security and other organizational units you have identified in your, when you defined your, your foundation or your baseline. 
And this should give you an idea how you could structure your organization and how you can apply, for instance, a service control policy to an organization unit. So you define that in your infrastructure team, and then you assign this policy to a specific organization unit or to all of them. Um, so you should, of course, not do this manually. Again, you should use infrastructure code for that. And here, at the end, finally, some code. Um, here's a little code example for, for how to define, for instance, a service control policy for an uh, organization unit. And um, the most important part is in the red circle. Uh, actually, this policy uh, denies uh, a specific, a specific actions. Um, in this case, uh, CloudTrail from stopping uh, stop logging. So it will deny the developer role or administrator role of your cross-functional team to um, stop the CloudTrail logging and also um, to create a user. And again, use CloudTrail. I don't want to bother you, but uh, all security measures are useless if you don't monitor your systems. And you can even uh, automatize um, these uh, things by, um, uh, because CloudTrail uh, submits uh, events to CloudWatch and, or uh, an S3 bucket, and you can implement, for example, a Lambda function, listen to these events issued by CloudWatch, and process these events. And if there is a significant concern, you may send notifications, uh, for example, to Slack. So now as the developer team has have the freedom to create uh, roles and policies, there are some challenges uh, these teams have to face as well. But of course, that does not mean that similar challenges occur on the infrastructure team side as well. They also have to struggle with all these roles and policies. Um, starting with the sh sheer mess uh, every IAM tool comes with, um, that can be really uh, frustrating. So it's not only AWS IAM, also uh, Google Cloud has a lot of, of uh, permissions defined, uh, which you have to find your way through. Um, so in other words, granular access control comes at cost and the cloud providers have comprehensive tools that allows you to do that. Um, the number of services, for instance, defined in AWS is really high and the number of possible actions you can allow or deny to be, be performed on specific resources is really sheer overwhelming. I heard that AWS IAM control, uh, sorry, AWS IAM comes with roughly uh, 4,000 actions and, and I think they are still counting. Uh, and if you look at the sheer, uh, at, at, at this mess, the first time you may think, oh my gosh, how do I ever get through that? Um, of course, you do not have to le learn all services and possible actions and keep them uh, in your head. There are doc good documentation and other resources that help, um, that really help to do so. So having these privileges in mind, um, uh, is, is, uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, this mess of, of things you have to deal with, uh, make it not really easy to, to do, define the policies. Moreover, the policy structure and uh, in quotes language is something uh, sometimes really odd. You can deny and have not equal conditions and these are even, no, there are even no action uh, you can define, so a lot of uh, negation, which you have to deal with. Just to give you uh, an idea on, this is um, a list of all the actions you can perform on the Lambda service. Um, and this is actually a really short list because um, there are really other, other services which have much more actions you can perform on them. Um, so having all the freedom, there are also some pitfalls when implementing your application specific IM. The team may have no, not the capabilities yet. And as mentioned before, you can experiment with IAM, but it takes time to learn it. A good measure is that, you, that the infrastructure team does not only control and set up their foundation, but uh, also provides support, uh, supporting services to the developer teams. That means 
that infrastructure experts come into the team and work together with them to make their first steps in IAM. Moreover, there are other uh, often time constraints which result into the tendency to get a little bit frustrated or even lazy. And there is, of course, also the human factor. Last but not least, there is this CI CD tools, and in particular, deployment pipelines can lead to some pitfalls. I will come to that in a bit. So, when working with IAM, you may uh, reach the point where you curse IAM and you may start thinking, can't I just simply put this little asterisk? No, just no, don't even dare. You should not even think about that. Uh, a little asterisk uh, can really create a mess and you will regret it. Um, uh, then, because refactoring of the, all these kinds of things without breaking something uh, is, uh, can be then really time consuming. And then it can tell you um, that will take really more time than setting up least privileges at the very beginning when you start. Um, yeah, least privileges, that is a journey and uh, it is an iterative process with a lot of testing and repeats. Um, and it's unfortunately in most cases a manually try and error. But there are some things um, uh, you, which can help you uh, to maintain your roles and policies. So uh, a good thing um, is um, to start with is uh, visualize your resources and permissions. You can use a poster or stickies, visualize and, and draw some things on that poster. Uh, visualizing helps a lot. You can look uh, at how scenarios and how services interact with each other, which access they need and define the permissions accordingly to your requirements. You can frequently update it when needed, when there are some changes and um, it will also help uh, new joiners of your, in your team. They can look at that and understand, oh yeah, that is how it's working for me. Um, put everything, of course, in infrastructure code and use a service control systems. Uh, sorry, um, uh, we, yeah, service control systems. A good practice uh, could also be a 4i principle. Um, that means, of course, that you store your entire IAM related infrastructure code in a dedicated uh, repository. And that also means that you work with pull requests. Um, also agree on the naming convention. Give your roles and permission meaningful names when you use, for example, Terraform code. And uh, a description is also sometimes quite useful. What is the intent of the policy? What is, it, uh, uh, what is the purpose of that? An important aspect is then uh, that you also test your policies. In that regard, Policy Simulator is your friend. Uh, policy Simulator is an access, accessible through AWS console. You can select a role with its uh, attached policies and then you can simulate actions on specific services. No worries, you won't break anything uh, because it's just a simulation. Um, and the simulator will show you the effect, whether it's allowed or denied. And, um, and you can even uh, use a policy simulator in automa automatic automatically in your test because it comes with some APIs you can use. And uh, last but not least, you should do regular reviews of your polic uh, policies and uh, test them. Um, maybe some of the privileges are not required anymore or sorry, uh, some policies may be not required anymore. And then you can take them out. Um, just a simple example, how you can visualize um, your resources and um, so that you can see, okay, what, uh, what is my use case? What are my requirements? Um, uh, for instance, here, a Lambda function or a serverless function that accesses uh, DynamoDB and um, you, may think about, okay, do I only need read access or do I need already also update and create the access? So you will certainly choose that, but you will drop uh, other actions like delete table or uh, list tables or something like that. And here, just a quick overview about um, the tools you can use. Um, so as mentioned, the policy simulator. Um, another interesting thing is uh, Scout Suite. 
uh, which you can also install in, on, locally on your laptop. It does not only provide or scan um, uh, IM, but it also scans, for example, uh, things like um, uh, security groups. Um, and it comes with an IAM dashboard, which shows, okay, which policies may um, uh, against the rules I've set before. Um, there's also a nice little tool like a PMapper where you can visualize your, your, um, uh, your policies and roles and what, what is accessing what. But um, maybe a poster in your team room might be more helpful because you then always can spot it uh, uh, when you are working. Um, last but not least, there is a list of uh, services and actions available uh, uh, on the link I show here. And um, that is really useful. It lists all services, but all its actions uh, you can apply to these services. Last but not least, uh, a lot of times already mentioned in this talk, um, is the CI CD tool. So now you define all your last uh, least privileges and policies in uh, policies and to protect almost everything um, and you are happy, right? Um, but wait, uh, what is about the CI CD tool? In order to deploy my, the infrastructure code uh, for my services and application, it, is re uh, it really requires a lot of permissions or uh, so it somehow requires to destroy, create and update these resources, doesn't it? So, and you may think, uh, oh my gosh, uh, this would uh, really require more or less God permission in the context of infrastructure. Um, and I show you a little example. It's almost a real life policy and I, I, um, it's already gone. So it has been refactored. Um, and I really do not want to make jokes about that. Uh, it's all human and can, think about um, time constraints I talked about uh, before. So what really happened here is that the number of services apparently was growing. Some services still limited uh, with regard to possible actions. But if you look, uh, for example, at the EC2 and the red circle, all actions are gone and there is an asterisk. And apparently you can do everything on any for and you are more or less permitted for everything. Um, as I said, I don't want to make jokes about that, but that entire policy you have seen before uh, could have been easier to defined by just putting list all the services and uh, asterisks and let it go. Okay, there might be some service control policies you may think in place that take care that uh, and limits the permissions for the team account and, um, and there might be also some permission boundaries that take care about that roles and policies are created safely and uh, no user can be created. And thankfully, there is hopefully a cloud trail there that will observe any suspicious activities. Moreover, the CICD tool may be only uh, serving pipelines for that team, but just imagine somebody hacks into that instance which serves uh, this EC2 instance, uh, sorry, this CI CD tool, um, it can blow up um, your entire account or your, even your developer and production account. Okay, that is indeed a striking example, but that can happen if you do not take time for rules and policies you want to uh, assign to your CI CD tools. So, how can you set up a CI CD tool in a more secure way if you? want to have your own one uh, in place and do not go with, for example, AWS pipeline and code pipeline because you have some good reason for that. For example, you want to be independent and you have a tool in place which have powerful features you do not want to lose. Having a dedicated team, uh, a CI CD tool for per team. So having this in place uh, really limits the risk that uh, all accounts get impacted in case of a threat. That still means that the tool can have a lot of permissions as it still can assume roles to do all things at least for this account. 
The second thing is keep in mind that the third steps uh, do not necessarily re require the full blown deployment um, um, permission. Uh, the same applies for your uh, test steps. And um, you have to consider, okay, I only do use one pipeline per service or function which I want to def uh, deploy. And how to reduce a little bit the mess uh, uh, of, of this, uh, maybe uh, of the, all the policies and all the permissions you have in, uh, in this policy is defining deployment roles per service. That means you have your CI CD tool running uh, in an, let's say, EC2 instance that has a specific role, but does, it does not have necessarily the deployment role. Um, and, uh, but uh, on the other hand, this CI CD tool has to assume all these roles. So it's not the super over securing thing, uh, still, the CI CD tool can assume. Uh, a role in order to deploy something, but there's a little hurdle. First of all, if there's co somebody coming into your EC2 instance, they need to know which role they have to assume. And here is a little visualization what I mean when setting up a CI CD tool more secure. Uh, in this example, I assume that you have a tools account where you run your, um, your uh, CI CD tool, and you have a dev account and a prod account. So, and all these little steps you see here, build, test, and uh, security scan, and there might be a bunch of more little steps in between before you start with the deployment are all dockerized. Um, so um, they are running, and then in this inside of these Docker, you can assume the role uh, in which you require to do certain things. And when it then comes to the developer uh, the, 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 um, deployment of, uh, into the development environment, uh, this container then assumes the deployment role in order to de deploy, for instance, uh, an EC2 instance or a Lambda function. And the same applies to the prod um, uh, step, to the deployment prod step. And this is how it could look like. Um, this is an ex a really, really, a light example about how uh, that can be defined. So this is an example for the deployment role you need or the CI CD tool need to assume. So it defines um, allow the update of the function and the update of the uh, function configuration for that particular resource and that is the uh, function uh, policy check. Um, uh, the next thing would be then um, the, the role that allows the, the CI CD tool to, uh, sorry, the policy that allows the CI CD tool to assume that um, deployment role. Um, and last but not least, um, there's a policy for the CI CD tool uh, that, uh, do the, that defines the assume role. Yes, so that is a little simplified view on how you can do that CI CD tooling a little bit more secure and do not apply uh, all the, the uh, permissions for every service. It's a little bit uh, more effort because you need to add uh, more policies, so extra policies for the deployment, but um, it is worth to spend, worth to spend, worth to spend the time um, as it, you also keep the overview on uh, what kind of deployments I have. So wrapping it up, um, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Uh, so I think these are the key, three key things you have to keep in mind when do, dealing with I am in the cloud. Do not start right away. So you really need to have a concept of revisit your security um, uh, use cases. Um, and uh, before you really start. Um, the least privilege should always go over time constraints. So there is no excuse to simplify and go the, the shortcut just because there is no time. And uh, that is also something which has to be understood by the business side because at the end, it's securing your environment. And um, I, I'm absolutely an advocate of delegating um, um, over um, uh, uh, of delegating 
uh, permissions to also to deal with IM to developer teams because otherwise you would really slow down the entire development process. So I think I'm done. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for a great talk. We, um, we will actually start Max talk right on time, which means we don't really have much time or any time, to be honest, for questions right now. I just wanted to ask you a brief question, Maya. So what you're saying is you should put an asterisk in everywhere to make it much quicker, right? To take all the pain out of the code. I'm just I, 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 Yeah, actually, yes. I mean, I, I also observed that on my own. I mean, if you, you are testing out these policies and you think, oh my gosh, and it's still not doing, it's still not working what I want to do. And you, you have sometimes this little tendency and this little devil on your shoulder, which tells you, oh, I will do that now. Uh, it's, I will, will clean it up later. You will, won't do that. And that exactly happens also to this huge policy you have seen. Um, the cleanup never happened. Right. Cool. Thank you for clarifying.